those of you who read the program, Tommy is a Burn and Gaza survivor, uh, and Eva is an Auschwitz Birkenau survivor, and, and Mindu is an Auschwitz Birkenau survivor, and, and a slave labor camp survivor. So if that gives your question to those you might want to ask, uh, you have this opportunity, the golden opportunity, so please do seize it both hands. Uh, with that in mind, uh, can we please open uh, the questioning with uh, volunteer from the floor? Any hands up from anybody, please? There we go, thank you very much. Uh, Hilda, just to your right, from the side. Could you put your hand up again, so just do, do clearly mark your words, the girls will see my voice, thank you. What's your name, please? <coughs> thank you. And who would you like to ask the question from? Um, Tommy. Tommy, okay, thank you. What was you fed when you were sort of in the camp? Tell me what, the question was, what were you fed when you were in the camp? What? What were you fed when you were in the camp? Yes. Fed, what were you eating? Yeah, <coughs> of course you know that uh, we were starved. Okay. We didn't start for a day or week. We start for months. And uh, when we talk about hunger and starving, that's two different uh, things. Uh, it's being hungry is something that uh, happens and you eat and you're okay. But starving it means that you don't eat for a long time. And uh, that's what causes the uh, people to become like uh, uh, skeletons because they starve for a very long time. Our food consisted, in the morning we got black coffee and two slices of bread. Uh, uh, for uh, lunch we had... Soup. 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 Turnips, yeah, but sometimes I forgot to it. We had turnips that were cut into square and boiled in water and in the evening we had again uh, two slices of bread and um, black coffee. It, to, to translate to a daily food that we eat as uh, today, uh, normally people eat about uh, 2,300 calories. Some people that work hard they even eat 3,300 calories. Our intake of food was a little bit over 600 calories. That's equivalent to six water crackers that we get today in the supermarket. That's what <coughs> we get every day, six, six water crackers. And of course, when you're starving, the body eats itself from inside. You become like a skeleton, and unfortunately, Finally, you die. And this is what used to happen in Bergen Belsen. Bergen Belsen was a detention camp, not an extermination camp, but in Bergen Belsen, more than 70,000 people perished from starvation, disease, and cold. Thank you, Tommy. Any other questions, please? Uh, thank you. This is your part. Hello, this question is addressed to all three of you. Um, it's often questioned as to what happened to God during the Holocaust. Um, how did that impact your faith, please? Well, um, we were not originally a very religious family, but in Austria, you had to have religious education in school. And so the Jewish children were called out of their class twice a week. And we had Jewish education in a separate classroom. And afterwards, we went back to our uh, class. So everybody knew who was a Jew. That was already the first bad thing. So as soon as the Nazis came in, we were already immediately attacked and discriminated. Um, but the, the education of Jewish uh, knowledge was very, very good. And so as children, we wrote to our parents and told them we want to uh, keep the Shabbat, we want to have the holidays. So we became, uh, through the education, more religious. But, you know, as children, you do believe what you're being told, there was a God and so on. And in the camp, the only thing what you could do was pray to God to stop those atrocities. 
everybody prayed. But of course, God wasn't there, or God didn't stop it. So I came out of the camp definitely an atheist. I didn't believe that there could be a God if you could tolerate that. But what was perhaps even worse, I lost my faith in humanity. Because when I realized what human beings are doing to other people, I realized, you know, that it's completely inhuman. And this was why, after the war, I was actually more depressed, especially when I heard that I lost my father and mother, than I was in the camp. I was 15 years old when I got in the camp, and I wanted to live. I wanted to experience life. But then afterwards, when I realized we would never ever more be a family, I became very, very depressed. But slowly, slowly, when I realized that it was Otto Frank who became my stepfather, who had no hatred for anybody, not even for the Germans. And he told me, you know, if you go through your life hating, you'll be a very miserable person, you'll have a bad life. And so slowly I realized there are some wonderful people around, there are wonderful things happening in the world, and uh, started to question, perhaps that is a God after all. Thank you. Mindy, do you have uh, any comment on the religion question? Pardon? Do you have a, uh, any comment on the religion question about your own? Well, I came to England on a stateless passport. Mm -hmm. And um, to come uh, on a stateless passport, you have like a, a type of stigma. So um, I came uh, luckily enough to England <coughs> to a very observant family. And the thing was, as an outsider, you join a community, and if you join a community, you belong to a synagogue, and like um, Eva, gradually I began to believe in God again, which I did not believe before. Um, and the fact that I belong to community, gradually I rejoined I reconnected with my Judaism and um, to try and contribute to the to contribute to the community and be part of a community. And once you belong to a Jewish community, um, you're not alone. And that was very important to me uh, coming to Thank you, Mindu. For those of you not familiar, uh, Mindu is a very prominent uh, member of the Singles Hill uh, Synagogue in Birmingham, uh, many of whose members and the rabbi will come tonight, uh, and we we'll look forward to it. Thank you. Any other questions, please, guys? Uh, Bess, you have a view on the side? Thank you. We're trying to distribute across the hall, but well done. We'll get to you soon. Girls, we'll go position for the next ones, please. Thank you. Keep the microphone right to your mouth, please. So the question is, uh, your first thoughts, and it's for all three of you, when you stepped onto the cattle cart for transportation and deportation. Well, we stepped into the cattle cart. Yes. We never knew where we were going. We, we hadn't got a clue that such a thing existed. There's no beings who we put in cattle cars. We in Catholic transportation used. Um, but at no point did we know where we were going or what was happening. But the horror of it was they were putting uh, people, uh, more and more people. Uh, by the way, our particular transport was just mothers and children. The men were taken away. Um, and they were in the so called army. Uh, there were just mothers and children, and it was the horror of it all it was tremendous. It was just a bucket in the middle with sanitation, there was no water for to wash, and um, it was just 
You could not believe it was happening. You think to yourself, is this, um, is this the 20th century or the Middle Ages? You couldn't believe such a thing was happening. Um, we were arrested, the four of us, and first in a holding camp, and then taken uh, later by cattle truck to unknown destination. It was a horrible, horrible journey. People, there was a woman who gave birth to a child. Um, people fainted. There was starvation already. It was the first time that we realized what hunger was. And, but it was the last time that I was together with my father, my brother, and my mother. And my father, with tears in his eyes, apologized to us that from now on he can't protect us anymore. We are on our own. And um, we didn't, of course, the Nazis never talked to you. We had no idea where we were going. We knew that Holland is the most Western, Eastern, Western country, so going to the East is bad. We knew about the concentration camps and death camps in Germany and Poland. We knew Auschwitz was one of the biggest, but of course we didn't know where we were going. And when we eventually arrived in Auschwitz, we thought our last days had come. I was just 15, and I really thought perhaps tomorrow I won't be alive anymore. Thank you, Eva. Uh, and just before we uh, move to Tommy for his answer, uh, out in, in context, Auschwitz uh, is a 25 square mile death camp, responsible singularly for 1.5 million deaths. Uh, Ava was two years in hiding, pretty much. Ava, not with Anna, uh, and she was betrayed and captured on her fifteenth birthday, just about opening your presents when the stormtroopers came to the door. I just want to add one more thing. You know, um, so Auschwitz was the biggest, with uh, many, many gas chambers. But in Auschwitz, at least, there was a selection, so you had the chance that you were not killed at arrival. There were other camps, <coughs> like the Blinker in Poland where there was no selection whatsoever. The whole transport, children, babies, uh, work people still were able to work. The whole transport went to a tunnel and straight into the gas chambers. Thank you. Tommy, you mentioned earlier to me at over lunch about um, that very thing about the cattle yes. uh, I, I lecture over at uh, school uh, in Ireland, I traveled all over the world. And many times uh, students ask me, what was the worst moment that you experienced uh, during the Holocaust? And uh, <coughs> it's funny enough, uh, but I found a terrible change in my life was also we were in detention camp in Slovakia, I'm from Slovakia. And then one day we were called out for roll call for a selection, and uh, the, the young man and woman went to the right side, uh, mother, children, and all people to the left side. And uh, of course, we knew already at that time it was towards the end of uh, uh, the war in, the, in late 1944. Uh, what was happening uh, to the Jews and we knew what that <coughs> selection uh, meant. And uh, here we were, the civilized people, we had all right in the detention camp and after the selection we were taken to the cattle cart and we were forced to use a cattle cart into. And, uh, I never forget that moment when, as a civilized person, I was put into the cattle car and once the door closed behind us, I was no longer a human being. I was like the boars and the, the animals that were transported uh, in this cattle car. There was straw on the floor in the middle there was an open bar with a couple of buckets which served as a toilet. We traveled like this for seven days. There was no hygiene, 
there was no privacy. We, from the first day, I always say, people were uh, worried that somebody else will see them and not them. all kind of avoidance, but of course you can't hold yourself back. And then the public, you have to do things. And this was, this happened from one minute to the next minute. So I say for me, uh, that was one of the worst moments uh, that I uh, could have uh, uh, experienced. Of course, I was in Belgium, Belgium for several months. I saw horrific things, uh, what happened there, and of course as children, uh, seeing all these corpses uh, lying around and playing among these corpses. But for me, I never forget the moment when my life suddenly changed from a human being to being like an animal. Thank you, Tony. Uh, any more questions, guys, from the top this time of the room? Uh, Pippa, if you could move along the line, please. Thank you. Do you still have your tattoos from Auschwitz? Yes, yes. After the war, um, you know, we had different worries about so there were people who had to move them actually. But I am actually, you know, there are still people who deny that the Holocaust has ever happened. So um, it's sort of proof, you know. If somebody would say to me, I don't believe, when this happened, I would put his nose on my number. I said, you see, I put the number on myself. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, maybe if you can come from this side, please. Yes, yeah, come up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, th this question is for all three of you. What did you do in this situation you're in to take your mind off what was happening? I'll show you after it. 
what did I do? I did these uh, dolls that we did in the concentration camp. It was done from wool. So our, we had jumpers, some of them were falling apart. So we took the wool out and we made this little boy and girl. And I made uh, these uh, dolls, boys and girls. And when I go to a primary school, I show them. <laughs> <coughs> I should have really brought them here. And when I come here, I said to, to my partner, you know, I forgot to bring these dolls. Otherwise, I would have shown you now these little dolls that we did in the car. Yeah. But Auschwitz, can I say yes. something? At Auschwitz, we, will, we have to stand sail held two to four hours each time, twice a day. And we would stand for selection. Then we would have a little time to get this terrible soup with uh, a piece of bread. Uh, but very often, uh, myself and a group of people were chosen to work in Canada. It was called Canada because of the wealth of possessions they, that they had there, that the people had bought in. So we would have to sit and tear open the linings of coats and jackets, look for vials that people have bought with them um, in the hope that they might survive and they've got something to fall back on. So there were boxes say, well, uh, 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 for watches, for rings, for diamonds, for chains. And the SS would stand over us shouting, Schnell, Schnell. And the days, I mean, we were woken at 4 o'clock in the morning, and the day just went by twice a day in sail appeal in all weathers. We had to stand. And very often, if the numbers didn't tell us, we would have to kneel and they would count again and again. Very often, we had the angel of death walking around uh, Mengele, who would be, if he didn't like the look of you, or you looked ill, or you didn't look right, and he would be immaculately dressed, carrying a pair of white leather gloves. And if he waved these leather gloves at you, you had to step out of line, and these people would never see you again. So, um, the time just went, and then we had to queue to, we wanted to go to a toilet. Uh, it was absolutely terrible. Well, Auschwitz was across a work camp, yeah. and um, yes, we had to get up early in the morning, we were still back two hours roll call, then we were taken to work, almost physical hard labor, the whole work, without food the whole day, without toilet allowance the whole day. In the evening, late, we came back, again two hour roll call, then we got our bin of bread, and that was it. And we tried to sleep, which were plagued by lice and bed bugs. Thank you very much. Eight people, yeah. Eight people in On a place as big as that. Yeah. And uh, very often we would find people there in the morning. Dead in the morning. That's where the whole code didn't. Exactly. It had to be recounted. Recounted again. Thank you, sir. Just one last question. I don't judge myself for the question this time. Ava, if I could ask the question of you, if I may, because I know you also do work with prisoners. There's a lot of work, a lot of uh, troubling times in education when the youth today are. Uh, there's concerns with mental health, the pressures for academic pressures, the social media pressures. You three have transcended the most horrific of circumstances and come out to raise families and live on your lives. If, would you have any advice for students of the nation, not just the ones here, about how you could give them a sense that there's something ahead of their troubles if they feel in that way? Well, you, know, um, you are actually living in a much more luxurious worlds than we lived. And, and I find you still demanding more things. You know, you should be happy with what you got. You should appreciate it, you should share it with your God, with people and not, not as much. And we count on you to change the world. 
there's a lot of problem here. There is again of anti-Semitism. There is discrimination against people who haven't grown up with you. There is the wars going on. There's terrible, terrible disputes going on in the world. The world is not at peace. And we, as the people who have gone through the most horrible time, um, are afraid that we haven't learned. And it will be soon. You learning from what we have told you through reading books about this period, that you will make your own decisions how you can try to change the world. The attitude of people to live we all human beings, doesn't matter if we're born in Africa or in India or wherever we come from, we are all human beings. And as well, it doesn't matter what religion you pursue. If you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, that is a very personal thing and relationship which you have with your God or with perhaps not with, you know, perhaps with a, a, a spiritual leader or whatever. And that should be accepted. There should be not a reason for quarreling and a reason for um, killing each other because this is what happened through centuries. Religious wars were something which has always been and always get more and more vicious. And this is something which I just don't comprehend. So it will be up to you to try to change the world so they can give your children a more peaceful and harmonious life. six books, four plays, four movies, and thousands and thousands of stuff online. It really came to impress on you. So if this is the catalyst you to learn more, Leonard, uh, John's dad's book about Leonard Bernie is a magnificent book. And uh, Ava has three books. One, one of them is written for younger readers called The Promise, Ava's Story, and After Auschwitz. Tommy has two books, I was a boy in Nelson, uh, and uh, Tommy is the most recent one. Uh, and Mindu has a huge amount of stuff online as well. So if ideally you would uh, use this opportunity, this forum, uh, this perhaps once in a lifetime chance and event to learn more and to do more uh, because the reason they're here is that they would want you to act in a way accordingly with their values and beliefs. So with, with that, uh, before I wish you a safe journey home, uh, a longer journey, and thank you so much for your support, please uh, can you show your appreciation to three amazing <laughs>